Denver. Oh, cool. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Public Works Finance <laughs> Committee meeting for Monday, March 25th, 2019. First order of business is approval of the Public Works Finance Committee, March 11th, 2019 minutes. Entertain a motion to do so. Mm -hmm. We're good. This will approve those, sir. Thank you. Item number two, um, the Water Filter Plant Art Project Commission Agreement. Nicole Baker's gonna tell us about that. Looking forward to this mural that's gonna go on the side of the water department. Good afternoon, Nicole. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in your packet, you have for the water plant uh, mural, you have the commission agreement for the chosen artist. You also have the site location um, pictures as well as um, <coughs> the aquifer cross section created by John Bert, um, Bush and others. So that was the um, initial inspiration for this project. Um, and I'll give you a quick timeline for it. Um, we had um, educational outreach for our conservation program is in, you know is included in the budget <coughs> as mentioned before the modified cross-section of the aquifer it's very colorful and it was a new inspiration so we thought you know how can we help educate our citizens about our shared aquifer and we thought this mural was a really good idea the site at the water filter plant is actually the site for the city's first well, so there's some historical significance for that. Um, also, it happens to be on a very busy street, so exposure would be fabulous. Um, we also um, figured that the building could use a colorful facelift. So um, from there, we thought, okay, let's get together with the arts department. And we had public work staff involved in the process. We created a call for artists. We sent that out and received some responses. From those responses, we had a few artists interest, interested and we picked um, Camille Cote as our artist for the installation as well as to help us with the design. So the idea for the design is John Bush's um, cross-section. However, we expect the <coughs> artists will have their um, artistic touch to it as well. Um, this design will eventually be approved before it is installed. Um, so be approved by who, who um, the um, we have a panel okay. of folks from arts department and public works mm -hmm. so we want to not lose sight of the educational component um, but we also understand that an artist is going to want to add their touch um, John Bush is also very on board with the whole process and idea of it um, let's see so um, we hope that this will be done and it in the contract it states that it should be done in time for this year's art walk uh, and so included like I mentioned is the commission agreement between the city of Moscow and Camille Cote for um, your consideration of approval well, I think it's a great idea and uh, I th thought about this and thought it'd be a good place to put it on the new underpass but uh, you guys your idea there is going to certainly get more exposure so um, i'm certainly in favor of it I'm how many sides does it wrap around um, just the west side it's we have um actually we want it to wrap around the two sides so we have while you're um, driving in from north to south bound on jackson you would first and again, depending on the concept and the design that's finally approved will depend on how it wraps, but we do hope to ha cover two sides of that building. So you're driving and you see it, and then as you're like stopped at that stoplight, you probably can you know, take a look at it. Um, for Art Walk, we're hoping that we can have a storyboard of this process and perhaps draw people to go over there and take a look at it. Cool, so on the north side and the west side. Yes, yes. I like it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think too having a visualization is such a nice way to engage with the material. Thank you. Which is really important. Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, I think it'll be great to raise awareness of the aquifer and water aquifer and water conservation efforts that are going on, and I think we're making good progress there. So the more public um, awareness of that, the better. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I think we should recommend that this move forward and uh, put it on the consent agenda. Okay. Enthusiastically. Thank you. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. So I'm going to stick around for the next one. Okay. <laughs> You're doing the Kelly Cooper part, too? Mm-hmm. Okay. The next item on our agenda is the Environmental Stewardship Award. We've got 
Oh, we're an entire crew of people <laughs> here. We're full Good. force today. <laughs> um, so I'm pleased to introduce Kelly Cooper this afternoon. Uh, she, for over two years, you want to have a seat? She, for over uh, two years, has been um, actively involved in all the city's environmental initiatives. Um, for those of you that are lucky enough to know Kelly, you know that she, her caring passion for the community and for sustainability shows in her work, and um, the Environmental Stewardship Award is no exception to that. Uh, she researched this. She created this program from the ground up. So with that, I'm going to let her take over and explain the details for you. Thank you. Welcome, Kelly. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to present this program to you. It was one of my very first AmeriCorps projects with the City of Moscow, and I'm eager to share with you the results of that work. Um, this program is unique in that there is no other city of similar size to Moscow that actually has anything like this. So Moscow is leading the way with this program, and I'm delighted to have been part of its creation. So the Environmental Stewardship Award was born out of a directive by the Mayor and City Council to have an incentive program for the Fats, Oils, and Grease, or FOG program. In discussing how to create such a program, we realized that there was a potential to expand outside of FOG and incorporate other City of Moscow environmental programs. It is designed to recognize those businesses that not only comply with pertinent ordinances and res resolutions, but go above and beyond that with their actions to take care of our environment. It also helps to encourage businesses to, take, to start taking action or further their efforts by providing information, ideas, examples, incentives, etc., all in one place. Knowledge is a key to spreading action. This also provides the city a way to spread the word on programs that are also available to residents, as an example, the toilet rebate program. Um, collaboration with our local businesses and utilities make our chances of success with this program much greater. Beyond that, it also gives us the opportunity to gather information to help make our other programs better. The spirit of collaboration has been incorporated into this program from the beginning, allowing a varied collection of local businesses, Latos Sanitation, and Avista a chance to see the program and provide fo feedback prior to launching. Um, so the application process will include an electronic application, which will gather the information necessary to determine eligibility as well as what, criter what criteria a business has completed. An inspection by city staff will be required to verify criteria have been met. This will also provide a window for city staff to share information regarding further actions that can be taken, and certification levels will be determined based on that verification. There are two certification levels at this time, bronze and silver. These can be expanded to include additional levels as the program progresses. Um, the award can be renewed every two years. This was um, preferable by both city staff as well as our focus group um, so that it's not so invasive to, to businesses having this to come in annually. So as I said before, the application actually has eight sections, each with its own set of criteria. Uh, this is where you can really see how the city's many different environmental programs are all tied together. Um, we recognize that not each, each business is unique and thus a one size fits all approach will not work. Um, therefore, each business will be evaluate, evaluated on only those criteria that are relevant to their business. For example, the transportation section includes a criteria specifying that company vehicles be fueled in the early morning or late evening. However, if a business does not have company vehicles, this would be stricken from consideration on their application. Um, so this is what the awards will look like. The two different certification levels are bronze and silver. Uh, bronze will require a minimum completion of 65% of applicable criteria, and silver will require 85%. We wanted to make these awards achievable, but not so easy as to hand them out to everyone who applies. Um, final thought, this program is not meant to be rigid. It is meant to be updated and refreshed in order to add additional criteria and levels, remove outdated criteria if necessary, and provide the latest information on best practices to keep Moscow moving forward. And with that, do you have any questions? I think it's a great idea. I'd like it too. Recognizing the people who are participating in environmental stewardship is always a good thing and something to display your business to 
get the public more involved and know who's actually involved working and realizes the issues associated with it. So, so much the better. I like it too. Sam, I'm just looking through, so in the award packet, it comes with a logo and a support letter. Does it come with anything they can put in their window or something they could display? Yeah, so those awards that you saw on the slide, those are going to be window stickers, so they will have them, or at least that's what they preferred. We've also been talking about the possibility of a roving award for the business that has completed the highest percentage of criteria. Gotcha. Thank you. Oh, tell me again when the application will be available. Like we hope to have it ready to roll out Earth Week. So our next step is to take this to council for full approval. Okay. Well, we'll certainly send it on for full approval. Yeah. I think we're unanimously in favor of that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for your work on this, Kelly. And thank you. Thank you. I was just going to ask that question, Tyler. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want this on the consent agenda? <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> okay, item number four is a clarification of the fiscal year 2018 CAFR. Um, we must have had some numbers that were nuts. Yes. Essentially what we've got is on your packet you have two um, different pages from the CAFR. What happened is the Moscow Urban Renewal Agency is a component unit of Moscow City Government. And as such, their, um, their audit numbers need to be included in our audit. So what happened is the URA was audited, Moscow was audited, the URA audited numbers should have flowed over into this page uh, in our audit. Through a Scrivener's error, which is the auditors just didn't catch it, so everything was transferred except for one debt service payment that needed to be paid. So it was included in the URA's audit, but somehow the numbers didn't go into ours. So again, it doesn't change the substance of the city's audit. Um, what we wanted to do was to bring it to you, uh, recognizing that it's just a reporting Scrivener's error. We make that adjustment because what was approved at council would differ by that one number in the page. So if that is fine with you, we're presenting the same thing to the uh, administrative committee, and if so, we will move ahead and make that one change, just swap that one page out, and then the audit will proceed. As far as I'm concerned, it's uh, something we should do, M move it ahead for mm -hmm. consent agenda. Okay. Assuming the other committee <laughs> yeah. has the same opinion. Good yeah. catch. Thank you. Okay, item number five is the uh, A Street Stage 2 Project Construction Schedule Revision. Kevin Ellie and Tyler Palmer are involved in this. I don't see Kevin in the crowd today. Uh, <laughs> I think he's abandoned me, Mr. Boland. <laughs> Discretion is the better part of the <laughs> This might have been the ominous bit you were referring to, Mr. Betke. It was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. Appreciate you all taking the time. Um, this is a... Uh, here to discuss the um, A Street construction project schedule. As we know, A Street has been a scheduled project for a long, 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 long time. Um, and uh, we were looking forward to a summer construction season, um, looking forward to construction, I guess kind of sounds like an oxymoron. No one really looks forward to construction, but we were looking forward to seeing a project get completed. Um, there were several factors that, uh, as, as, we, as we went through the process of preparation for the A Street project, there were a number of factors, including um, some funding that you'll recall that the city front-loaded the project with. Um, the state's bidding process uh, was they, their bidding software. They, went, they uh, renewed their bidding software this winter, um, and so it was down, and they weren't able to bid projects for a while, which caused a backlog. Um, there was a ripple effect that impacted LTAC um, and LTAC's review process. Um, and I guess to cut to the chase, they were preparing to bid our project here probably next week. And so we weren't going to bid the project until early April. Now, the window for this project was mid-May through mid-June for a start date. 
um, with 115 working days. You know, we this far north of the 45th, we really have a pretty narrow construction season. And one of the other challenges that we really run into is with our relative geographic isolation, if we're not pretty early getting on somebody's schedule, it can have a very negative impact on our bid prices. And so as we looked at this, we were concerned that this would this would probably have a if, if we were to get qualified bidders that the price would be pretty exorbitant this year and then that that became an, a, a further concern because we could say okay well if we get high prices then we'll just bid it out again next year but the concern with that is, is something that we've seen and seen here in Moscow in the past is we didn't want to set a precedent for prices so that when people bid it the next year same companies they throw the same price at it rather than sharpening their pencil and taking a new look at it and we had this discussion with uh, our city manager, uh, Gary Reedner, city supervisor Gary Reedner, and, and uh, Mayor Lambert and uh, staff, and we came to the conclusion that it was probably best to ask LTAC to delay the bid of this project until the fall. Um, we feel like late summer, fall, if we put the bid out then, we're more likely to get more competitive bids, get on somebody's schedule early. There's a large slew of ITD projects that will bid around that time that will have a lot of interest, and it's possible that we'll, we'll get picked up with that big group of projects and get some better pricing. And so what what we're here for today is we've drafted a letter. Um, I, LTAC re requests a letter from the local entity um, that, that basically asks them to bid this at a later date for next year construction and that's that's what we have we're recommending so the staff recommendation is that we that we ask LTAC to bid this project late summer early fall in order to shoot for uh, next construction season a couple of the things I would mention that this would allow is it does allow us to work with the franchise utilities so that they can move do the work that they need to do this summer um, with as with as much work as has to get done in this project in a very narrow corridor it can get really difficult to do have the logistics work out of people moving in and moving out and so it would allow some work to be done this summer with the franchise utilities to get them out of the way and it may allow us to look at the staging of the project and there may be work that we can have done earlier in the construction season some of the wall work potentially that we can get a little bit of a head start and give the project a better chance to get completed within the window of work next construction season. And with that, I'd stand for any questions. Gary. Uh, the letter that you find in your packet is a draft from the mayor to um, Jeff Miles at LTAC. Uh, what we're asking today is to get recommendations for approval from both committees. Uh, in order that LTAC gets direction as quickly as possible, what we'd like to do is if we get the approval of both committees' recommendation, the mayor will send that letter out tomorrow, and then we'll be asking for ratification of that authority in the, um, on the April 1st council meeting. The reason for that is that's a little bit extraordinary, but we don't want LTAC to feel, well, if Moscow hasn't made the call yet, we feel compelled that we have to bid it out. You also recall, as Tyler indicated, as the mayor mentions in his letter, this project's been on the book for 30 years. We've done part of it. We're really aching to get to phase two. To have a project that's 30 years old, that you're only on phase two, is a little bit extraordinary. So we've been pressuring folks to get it done as quickly as possible. Just didn't shake out that we could get it done at this time. People have been expecting it. Uh, we had a public works meeting this morning. People in that area are fully expecting construction in the 19 or 2019 uh, construction window. So there will have to be some outreach on the part of public works, letting folks know that it'll be delayed till next year. One thing we wanted to avoid for sure is bifurcating the project. So we didn't want the road torn up. Somehow we run out of time, and we've got a torn up road over the winter season. So this seems the best way to go ahead. You'll also remember that we prepaid uh, a million two, I believe, on this project uh, because of the cycle of federal funding in order to make sure it wasn't constructed over two construction seasons. LTAC was getting their money in two separate budget years, federal budget years. So those funds will remain in Boise and uh, we'll leave them there as we're moving toward the 2020 season. Uh, those funds still belong to the city of Moscow, and my understanding is any interest generated on those funds remains the city of Moscow's. 
Additionally, we wanted to make sure that we are not putting the federal funding in jeopardy at all by asking for this delay. And we've been assured that that money's been appropriated. It will be, if it's not already in LTAC's hands, it will be in LTAC's hands, and there shouldn't be any problem with that. So it looks to be about as safe as possible. I heartily agree with, with uh, the decision to move forward with waiting till next year. We've just seen this late in the season, if somebody has to mobilize, they come in, they're already in a compressed time frame. There's a lot of areas where you could make mistakes. And those mistakes usually translate to increased costs. So we want to try and get the best foot forward we can. And this seems like the way to do it. As a point of clarification, do they know we're looking at making this decision? They yes. do, right? Yes. Uh, when, as, as we looked at this and started to become concerned, Kevin Lilly and I had been in contact with uh, LTAC and had several conversations and worked through the different options for how this would look. And so they're, they're aware that, that this is the recommendation from staff, and, and they're anticipating a letter, knowing that we have to come through our city council before we can actually submit the letter. Great. It's not a surprise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was um, IDT and LTAC's idea to move this project for ahead of what we originally, it was, I think it was originally scheduled for 23 or something like that. And we moved Mountain View funds over to deal with this to get it ahead. So it's kind of disappointing that it's getting delayed again but that's the nature of the beast um it <coughs> has it been considered at all that we could do the the cul-de-sac portion of that this year because could we split that out we, and we do took that? we took a hard look at, at ways to phase the project and and the problem that you run into is there's no there's no good quasi midpoint for the project and so what you'd end up doing is I mean you could do that but you would you would escalate costs because if you get somebody to mobilize out to do some smaller chunk of the work and then they've got to remobilize to do the rest of the work we're gonna end up paying mobilization twice demobilization twice we're gonna th and there'd be multiple other costs that we'd incur associated with that and so as we looked at it, it, it you know, really, the, the the stuff that we can do, as I mentioned, was things like the franchise utility work, stuff that's not associated with the project, but is work that still needs to be done. But there, there really isn't a good place to dice this one up. You'll recall too that uh, you can cul-de-sac off Circle Drive, as you indicated, but you've also got that big elevation change you're making in Lion Street. So it's those the project two dovetail. Goes together. They, yeah. they domino out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So well, sorry to see that. <laughs> Given we're kind of painted into a corner here, I have to express deep disappointment with the state and their bidding process for a project that we've known is coming down the road for a long, long time. And yet again, here we are painted into a corner by the state who grouses about the federal government all the time, and they don't mind passing it on downstream to us. So I'm extremely peeved about that little aspect of things. Also is the delay of this project, given the cascading dominoes we're always facing with LTAC, is this going to have a downstream impact on the scheduling of the Mountain View project? It it shouldn't because this is th these are funds that have been, as Gary mentioned, the, the funds have been allocated for this project. And so the, the funding doesn't shift and the funding year actually doesn't shift for the project. Yeah, and but so with the way LTAC works, okay, you know, you've got yours, now we've waited a few years, and Mountain View has been getting kicked down the Mountain View Road like a can for years and this seems to me that if this is postponed they say well Moscow got this one in 2020 we're going to move Mountain View on out another couple years through their errors and what are the chances of that happening I hard to speculate I I, I don't I, I suspect that just speaking I obviously I'm just opining here but I, I think that there is a there's a motivation to see a street happen I think every everybody knows how long it's been on the books and I think that there is a sentiment I don't think that they're super happy that this is where we ended up to haven't haven't asked them to bid it later I think they would have preferred to see it go and so I, I don't suspect that that would be the case yeah, it's been my uh, experience in these state federal aid grants that it's a matter of money um, they can We've always helped out with engineering. We've engineered, designed some of the projects ourselves, turned that over. Actually, A Street, we've done a large part of the design as well. So I don't think it's a matter of when the, the project gets built as much as 
when the funding is allocated. And once it's off their books or it's it's earmarked for this project, we're free to go out and do whatever. And in all fairness, and I'm far be it from me to stand in the bureaucratic shoes of the state, but um, eight or Mountain View is a huge project. We've attempted to do that locally. Uh, we've amassed funds, accumulated funds, and we have utilized those funds because it's such a big project, such as College Street, this project. So we've moved funds around in order to get the most bang for our buck. So uh, Mountain View, we'll, we will continue to work at. Uh, as you know, we applied for a Build America grant, I think it was this last year, uh, to try and get that done. We will continue to do everything we can, but Mountain View Road, likely will proceed in a piecemeal fashion unless we can find some other grant funding source. Yeah, it seems to me that was on the books for 2023 or something. Yep. When I, and, and I would point out just specific to Mountain View that the right-of-way acquisition monies are available coming up now, and so we're actually starting to work on that process now. And so that's, that's still in, in movement. Yeah, so as long as the Mountain View project doesn't get sopped up in this because, well, it is what it is, so I think moving forward in the way you proposed is the only sensible thing to do, but I just don't want to see future projects get caught up in the, the vortex wavering behind this one. We will endeavor that that does not happen. Um, I, I guess we will approve the change in the bid advertisement. Um, move that forward uh, it's going to be presented to administrative as well isn't it this uh, yes and then it'll go yeah. on if you want it to go on consent agenda administrative committee has that same idea yeah. we'll just put the ratification language in that I think that's the way to proceed and just want to make sure that you're comfortable with the mayor sending that letter out as quickly as possible so that we don't compromise our uh, yeah sooner the better as far as communicating with LTAC and IDT this you know it's disappointing that since it was their idea to move it up in the first place that we their actions cause us to delay it, but that's the way it is. And so Everybody has software issues. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Palmer. Uh, item number six on today's agenda is self-funded employee health insurance proposal. Gary's going to tell us about that. If you don't mind, I'll just speak from here. Uh, this will be my, I think, fourth presentation about this. Um, as you know, council on... Um, May 21st authorized uh, the city to move forward with a self-funded um, employee insurance program. A lot of reasons for that. Let me grab my notes. Again, there were a lot of reasons for that, but uh, the main thing was that we were trying to uh, stabilize, if you will, and make sustainable the uh, current employee health insurance. Uh, we had seen some fluctuation, especially with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, as well as medical inflation that's been going on, which was far outpacing uh, regular uh, CPI numbers. So we were looking for a way for us to be able to keep providing good health insurance for the employees while making it a sustainable program, one that was affordable for the city. So uh, council gave us the go ahead to do that. We retained Milliman Consulting. And when I say we, I'm referring to staff as well as um, Murray Group, uh, which is our uh, consultants in Coeur d'Alene. They've been our consultants, I believe, for about eight or nine years now. Uh, so they helped us run these numbers. <clears throat> what you see before you is, and you saw something like this when we made the presentation to you uh, back in May. What you see before you is 10 years of the usage of health insurance by uh, city employees. Uh, right here is 100%. So um, when an insurance company looks at uh, what it costs to have insurance, they look at, okay, you get 100% of premium paid in, how much of that are you paying out? 
Now the insurance company has to make profit. They need to pay for their administration. Uh, they need to pay taxes because they're a private entity. Uh, so all of that is built in. That number runs right around 15 to 17%. So uh, typically where you wanna be if you're an insurance company is somewhere around 83 to 85% benefits paid out or expenditures paid out. Uh, for 100% of, of premiums paid in. So as you can see, this red dotted line is the average that uh, City of Moscow employees have uh, expended for a dollar paid in. So uh, you'll see these numbers here are accumulated for years. This is 2008, this is 2018. So you can just see from there. Uh, one year we utilized 83% of uh, expenditures paid out versus dollars paid in, 82% the following year, 74%, and then we had a spike of 100% down to 71, 69, 85, and so on and so forth. Uh, when we first talked about <clears throat> actuarially and statistically what made sense for a self-insurance program, and what Helblings told us and the information that we got um, through our research is that typically uh, eight out of 10 years, you will see that you will be below 100% of premiums paid in. And as you can see, that's about where we are here. We've got one year out of 10 years was above 100%, all the other years significantly below 100%. Now, for an insurance company, and if I've got to make my 15% uh, to make money as a company, that 90% doesn't look great, neither does that 92. Obviously, the 107 doesn't look very good. But in a typical 10-year period, about eight of those years, you will finish the year paying out less than your premium or um, contribution under a self-funded program. Um, so you will actually save money. Now, if we pay that to a full-service insurance firm, as Regents Blue Shield is, or Regents Group, that's who we have now, then that year that uh, you had 69% usage, great year for them. They paid out 69% of the funds. The other 31 cents either went, well, they retained it. So they utilized it for their profit administration taxes and then made a healthy profit on top of that. Um, so as I said, you pay your premium in at the end of the year, they put the money in their pocket. You start out from zero again, starting your new premium year or plan year. Um, two out of 10 years, typically, you will be at or above 100%. So about 80% of the time, you will have a better financial outlook and 20% of the time, you're at risk to be above paying out more than um, you actually have paid in. So. When we set up the self-insured program, we were looking at how do we allocate that risk. So uh, what we do is we had to pick actuarially where was our best number to self-insure. Self-insurance just means that through our contributions to the Employee Benefits Trust, you recall in uh, February, or excuse me, January, council approved formation of the Employee Benefits Trust and appointed trustees uh, to that trust. Uh, those funds go in, um, the Employee Benefits Trust. Oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> the cost benefit and how much we're packing away in the trust. Oh, yes. Okay, so those funds go into the trust and year to year, if we're not expending it, it stays within the trust and you're able to build funding in the trust. Um, so we looked at it and said, okay, as we're looking back at how we allocate that risk, we looked at how much we could self-insure for a group of our size and the premiums or contributions we were making. It was decided that $75,000 was the number. So uh, we looked back at major claims. Typically we run anywhere from one to three, one to two uh, major claims per year. So those would be claims that exceed $75,000 in total. And what we have done, or what we were negotiating with uh, Regents Blue Shield, they were going to do the administration of this new Employee Benefits Trust. Um, we talked to them about getting stop loss insurance. And stop loss insurance just covers anything over 
thousand dollars in an individual claim now that doesn't mean every other member of the group has a claim up to seventy five thousand uh, dollars so you look at all those claims that's what milliman was doing so that seventy five thousand uh, dollars covers an individual claim that comes in the expenses exceed seventy five thousand dollars and then what happens if you have several claims above seventy five thousand dollars you also have an aggregate stop loss insurance and that aggregate essentially says that if you pay out over 125 percent of your contributions for that year the aggregate stop loss insurance kicks in and they cover everything for the rest of the plan year now financing that where we pay premiums to regions uh, group now we would be making contributions to the employee benefits trust the city pays for the employee and half of the employees dependents at that time or at this time uh, we've been just paying those premiums directly to regents as soon as the employee benefits trust is set up and, and we start the self-funded plan those contributions now they aren't called premiums because the employee benefits trust is not an insurance company they get paid into um, the employee benefits trust the employees who have dependents 50 percent of the dependent coverage is the responsibility of the employee they would also pay that money into the employee benefits trust so um, we looked at this and said okay we need quotes for administration of the trust the claims because nobody downstairs in finance is going to be looking at an emergency room record and determining how much you're going to pay on it that's all done by an administration administration firm and we would contract with regents blue or regents group which is a great seamless way to do this <clears throat> and um, so we go back we take a look at uh, what it is going to cost for administration then we look at what is it going to cost for the stop loss insurance because we have to to mitigate that risk through additional insurance well we got the quote back in I think it was January and the quote for stop loss insurance was a certain amount of money I want to say it was somewhere around two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars and that was for seventy five thousand dollar individual and hundred and twenty five uh, percent uh, in the aggregate since that time uh, Regents who sees all of our claims right they're paying out any claim that comes in by an insured employee so they're monitoring this as well and in that period of time they saw a spike in number of major claims and where we usually have one to three one to two uh, there are five to six major claims at this time and that's just the breaks of the game again two out of ten years you can expect that you're going to be above hundred percent while the other eight years statistically you're supposed to be low well the issue is when as you know anybody who has insurance uh, for the same coverage you never see cost of insurance go down even when those years that these these uh, looking at what's before you here all of these low numbers here that should have res represented a very hefty profit margin to a private insurance company never did they come back in the next year and say oh by the way we're lowering your premium it stays the same or there's an inflationary factor to it whatever a big part of the cost or the the uh, calculation of health insurance is both inflationary factors and the experience or use of the insurance by the employees so uh, naturally if you're seeing an uptick in major claims you're going to see your stop-loss insurance go up as well so we want to make sure that um, and, and it doesn't come down so what we want would like to do and what we're asking at this time we anticipated an April 1st launch date for the self-insurance we would now like to wait until fiscal year 2020 and a kickoff date of January of 2020 the reason is we believe that again this is an aberration we think it'll come right back down to its statistical norm and then we can get a quote for uh, the stop-loss insurance which is more reasonable the increase was somewhere around $150,000 so it is a big amount of money so we want to make sure that we get the best uh, calculation of premium possible so we had told the council that we were shooting for april 1st 
give or take, whenever the Department of Insurance gave us our final approvals. What we'd like to do now is we would like to delay implementation until, uh, as I said, um, budget year 2020 and a January 2020 launch date. Well, oh, go ahead, Art. Oh, so, uh, so what happens to the employees with insurance for this next year? Have we been working with the insurance companies to continue what we've got? Yeah, great question. Just what we did last year, when we looked at self-insurance, we let regents know that we were looking at self-insurance, but we needed to continue our program, the current program, until, that, uh, until we launched that. They have no problem with that. Of course, they would rather we stayed on the full service insurance than go with uh, the self-insurance, but makes sense for them to, they offer administration services, they offer full insurance services. What we would do in this case is we would do what we typically do about this time of year when we're working on budget. We will go out and we will get a quote from regents and build that into the budget. And as in years past, we will look at the quote and if it's determined that the quote is extraordinarily high, we will either try to negotiate that or the council has directed us to go out and get additional quotes from other providers. We don't know what that is yet because we haven't asked them. But we anticipate no issue with continuing our current coverage until, again, the self-insurance takes over. And the trust fund <clears throat> remains quiescent until the subsequent year. Yeah, you also see in the 2020 budget, uh, council allocated, we indicated that uh, the surplus that we originally were told by uh, DOI and actuarial and we needed to put in was about 435000 We have designated that and allocated that. It has not been appropriated. We were going to do that when we open up the budget. So what we will do is we will just build that money into uh, the FY 2020 budget. So as I said, it's there segregated it's not appropriated yet so we will likely look to appropriate that in the 2020 budget um, so everything will stay the same there should not be any um, increase in costs just whatever inflationary increase that you would see in a standard insurance policy anyway uh, but again since we represented the council and the employees that this was going to happen we wanted to also advise you that it's the advice of Murray Group and staff that we wait on that. I've made presentations to uh, two all-employee presentations uh, presented to the Employee Advisory Committee and the Police Department as well. So they've all been advised of the situation. So it's a complicated issue. Um, Probably just based on what I presented, yes. <laughs> well, the the uh, stop loss insurance is something that's built into the standard policy i'm sure they, they yeah have they're that. buying it from somebody too or spreading the risk among their own group right. and as since we have that we have the standard policy now uh and our experience has been higher likely our premiums will go up <coughs> and so that will be a factor will have to be considered but we don't have any information on that at yeah. this time all we know about is that the stop loss thing is going to go up to the point where it would probably exceed our 17 percent uh, savings that we would get by self-insurance so it seems like the best thing to do is, is delay it and see if we can't get a better until we have a favorable cost spread there yep that's it in a nutshell okay thank you for the presentation I, Good um, question um, was that uh, five to six incidents is that per the fiscal year is that, that what they're is, looking at that is for our plan year which is August 1 through July 31st Huh, thank so, you. Um, yeah, and I, I can't say that it's unprecedented. I mean, it may have occurred several years ago that I don't recollect. Uh, I will note that there have been years when the Regents' renewal would come in and it would be above 20%, and we would negotiate that down as best we could. We've had, got, had a long, uh, pretty fruitful relationship with Regents. Uh, and we've always been able to come to a pretty good compromise. Um, if we are seeing an experience, as I said, the major factor in insurance renewals and uh, increased premiums is the use of the insurance by uh, the group. And if we're seeing greater use, then we're going to see a higher premium. But uh, hopefully 
we look back on that 10 years, you can see that that is not our track record. And I actually am very proud of the way that our employees utilize their health insurance. They ask for generics at the pharmacy. They don't run to the emergency room for things they don't need to. So they're really making good use of the insurance. And that translates into more reasonable premiums. Any further? Mm -mm. No, nope, that's it. Um, well, I think we should advance this as you know that act action to uh, delay this implementation until we can get a more favorable um, outcome okay thank so. you very much we will be coming to the whole council on the first okay uh, item number seven on today's Janice downtown survey report Jen Piffner and uh, Kyle Snyder are going to tell us about that the long-awaited report <laughs> All right, thank you good afternoon I really do appreciate the council's understanding and having to delay this report <coughs> last week um, Kyle actually did a tremendous job of identifying um, an issue in the formula and how we were counting non-response rates to ensure that our percentages reported in the report were as accurate um, as they need to be. Um, I, I appreciated that as my first citizen survey. I presented twice because I nearly made the same error but got it through the presentation and he caught it before. So I did appreciate that. And your understanding and the community's understanding is greatly appreciated. Um, I was just going to talk for a quick moment about uh, the survey process itself. The um, specifically when we talk about confidence intervals for our surveys, we did do two surveys, one to residents and one to businesses. The uh, business or pardon me, the citizen resident survey was done just as we do our citizen survey. So we take the entire population of um, Moscow, we purchase a mailing address list for that group. Um, we did ensure since we had the citizen survey and this survey going on at the same time, we used two different uh, 1,200 addresses. So no one person got both uh, surveys. We thought we'd share the love a little bit that way. Um, once we sent those surveys out, we did get a return of about 293 resident responses, uh, which was nice. Um, this does affect our response rate a bit in that it was about a 24% response rate. Pardon me, it affects our confidence interval. And then um, thanks to Bill Belknap as well for helping um, us to understand better confidence intervals when we look at the business survey specifically. We had a population of 276. We did purchase that address list from a third party uh, to ensure that we were able to get a good uh, population, use the entire population as our sample, and we had 110 responses received from that. So about a 39% return there. Um, as such, our margins of error were at 5%, but our confidence intervals for the two surveys were different. For the resident survey, we were looking at a 91.5%, and then for the business survey, we were at 82%. And in short, that means that we have 82% um, confidence that any one answer that was given by, for instance, the business survey, um, plus or minus 5% from that one answer, if we asked another business owner, they would answer in that range. Um, we did add a little bit more to page one um, to try to explain that confidence interval piece a little bit more because it, it is the most um, technical piece of the of the survey and we talk how we talk about that so uh, that would be one small change from the version you have in your packet so with that um, I'm very happy to have both Frederick who you met last week and then Kyle to here to help us with surveys they do a tremendous amount of data entry and it's a great project I think for our masters of public administration students out of the University of Idaho to um, kind of get their feet wet with and so they both jumped into this internship at the, about the same time with two great survey projects uh, so Kyle did have the opportunity to work on this and I'll let him go through the results and then if we have any questions or if you have any questions we'd be happy to answer those as well stepping back just a little bit you said you had a 24 percent response rate on the citizen portion and 39 percent on the business and yet the confidence interval is less when you have a higher response rate that because of the because of the total sample um, that you actually receive the number you actually receive back um, because our population is so much smaller you're yes <laughs> It's got to do with the sample size. Yeah, yeah. right. Statistics. Yeah, so yep. we only had 110 to work with as opposed to 293. Oh, I see. Okay. So just everything shrinks um, kind of proportionally. 
Um, yeah, good afternoon, and thank you again for the understanding with last week and the delay in the survey. I uh, really appreciate it, especially for my first presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, so like she said, this was my first survey done, um, and we had uh, 1,200 resident surveys, 24% response rate um, with the 293 responses, um, and then a 39% response rate with 110 responses. Um, the survey um, had three questions in which uh, survey takers could respond on a one through six uh, Likert scale. The uh, responses went from strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree, and don't know. Um, the first three uh, questions were additional public and private colleges and universities should be allowed in the central business district. Um, with an approved conditional use permit. Actually, I think I have them right here, yeah. With an additional um, approved conditional use permit. Second one, uh, additional public and private colleges and universities should be allowed in the central business district without an approved conditional use permit. And then the third one, additional public and private colleges and universities should not be allowed within the central business district. And um, that on the screen is exactly how they showed up in the uh, survey. So for the resident responses for um, with an approved conditional use permit, uh, what we saw was a 58.36 strongly disagree um, or disagree and a 30.72 strongly agree uh, or agree with the statement 8.19 uh, said neutral and then a 2.73 don't know or non-response rate question for you yeah. why did you choose to lump in strongly and just agree for disagree and agree um we did that just for easier graph to read on here on this do you guys have the I handouts yeah. yeah um you can see it's split out in the packet if i may this is something we've typically done with the citizen survey as well just to show kind of the two sides of the equation um of course with neutral being um an individual that didn't have an opinion one way or the other just to kind of uh, provide that that grouping of for and against yeah thank you um so this is the resident uh, response for question b without an approved conditional use permit we saw 82.94 strongly disagreed or disagreed with this statement uh 7.51 strongly agreed or agreed uh, 6.14 don't know or non-response and then a 3.41 neutral. Um, part C additional public and private colleges uh, and universities should not be allowed within the central business district saw 60.41 strongly agreed or agreed with this um, 25.6 strongly disagreed or disagreed uh, 5.46 don't know and non-response and 8.53 neutral. Um, this was the business response to uh, question 1A with an approved conditional use permit. 58.18 uh, strongly disagreed uh, and or disagreed with this statement. 33.64 strongly agreed uh, or agreed. 6.36 were neutral and 1.82 don't know or non-response. Uh, Part B without an approved conditional use permit. Uh, 79. 09 strongly disagreed and or disagreed with this uh, 13.64 strongly agreed or agreed 3.64 were neutral and 3.64 uh, 3 either strongly don't know or, or I mean sorry don't know or no response <coughs> Part C additional public and private colleges and universities should not be allowed within the central business district 60.91 strongly agreed and or agreed with this statement uh, thirty percent strongly disagreed and or disagreed uh, seven point two seven were neutral and one point eight two was the don't know or non response rate for this <coughs> um, so survey question two was do you believe the current public and private colleges and universities are a positive or negative feature of downtown Moscow um, in this a part of this question there were two sections where they could list uh, positive attributes of the current public and private colleges and or negative attributes um, or a negative was also a part of it um, two sections and so 
Question uh, two, do you believe the current public and private colleges and universities are a positive or a negative feature of downtown Moscow? We saw the residents um, had a 49.49, somewhat negative and or extremely negative <coughs> uh, view on this. 36.18 said extremely positive and somewhat positive. 11.6 said neutral um, and 2.73 said don't know or non-response. These were the comments uh, broken down. So the positive comments for residents um, were, uh, the top three were economic growth downtown, uh, more people and students, and a positive perception of the Whammy program. Uh, the three top three negative were parking and traffic, the impact of uh, New St. Andrews or Christchurch, and a loss of tax revenue. Uh, this is business response to question two. Um, our positive or negative future of downtown Moscow, you had 47.27 say somewhat negative and or extremely negative, 41.82 extremely positive and or somewhat positive, 7.27 neutral, and 3.64 as don't know um, or a non-response. And their comments broken down, their top three positives were economic growth downtown, more people and students, and building renovation. And then their top three negatives were parking and traffic, loss of tax revenue, and um, NSA and Christ Church. Uh, survey question three was, do you believe any new public and private colleges and universities or the expansion of current colleges and universities would be a positive or negative feature in downtown? And the comment section was set up as uh, exactly the same as the question before with a positive section and a negative section. Uh, the resident response to this was 63.48 uh, felt that an expansion would be somewhat negative or extremely negative. Um, 23.21 extremely positive or somewhat positive, 9.9 .9, uh, neutral, and then 3.41 Mark don't know or did not respond. Um, the comments for this, the top three were economic growth downtown, more people slash students, and building renovation, and then the top three negative were prevents future downtown business, uh, parking and traffic, and then the impact of NSA and Christchurch. Um, the business response to question three, expansion of current college and universities uh, would be a positive or negative feature in downtown Moscow. You saw 62.73 um, responded with somewhat negative or extremely negative, 27.27 uh, extremely positive and or somewhat positive, 5.45 was neutral and 4.55 was don't know and or non-response. Uh, their top comments for positive attributes were economic growth downtown, more people slash students, and building renovation. Um, and their top three negative were parking and traffic, prevents future downtown business, and losing small business community to college campus. And that... Mm -hmm. that? <coughs> Good. I was surprised at the extent to which the residents and businesses tracked almost exactly with their response rates. It was really surprising that they matched up as closely as they did. It seems to be a unanimity of opinion on that one. So the next question is, what do we do with the results? Well, the next step, <clears throat> they're being presented to you tonight. They'll be presented on Monday. Um, this is just a report at this point given to you, allowing you to ask any questions about technical aspects of it that you would like. Um, as you recall, council was the one who asked that the survey be conducted so there could be additional information provided to the council in making the decision on which way to go with educational institutions in the central business district. So at this point, I don't believe that the question is ripe to be discussed. Uh, for one thing, the other committee has not heard it yet. And if the council wants to proceed with some discussion on it, I would suggest that Monday night, April 1st, uh, would be the place to at least broach, at least broach the subject. Uh, during that time, we can certainly map out if council has uh, some direction they would like to go, if they want to see some changes or uh, however they want to proceed with it, then staff can help advise on how to make that happen. Yeah, you know, I would think that uh, this is something that we need to discuss as the, a body of six and and have some time I mean this is a great presentation and it's uh, th but there's still a number of things to think about there and I think we have another week to think about it and bring that discussion to council and uh, 
we may come up with some uh, suggestions on how we want to proceed. Uh, but uh, certainly, right now, we don't need to be making any decisions on that with just three of us. Or So um, I guess I would ask, is there anything, any information that's been presented today that you would like expanded in any way or additional analysis done? If not, we will make the same presentation to the Administrative Committee and then on to Council next Monday. I think the write-up was pretty thorough and includes the breakdowns of the larger chunks in the pie chart, uh, so we can parse those out if we want to, but I thought it was quite well done and thorough. I don't have any further questions on it. My preference would be to see the pie charts broken out into strongly and just agree for the purpose of the presentation. Seems reasonable. That would, be, that would be my only request. Otherwise, I think it's good to go. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So good. Thank you Thank very you. much. Well done. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Oops, sorry. I think it presents a pretty clear picture the public opinion and the business opinion of what's going on. It does. Okay, now we're down to the report section of today's agenda. Um, we're going to do something about the hot water right away weed control report, which seems like a uh, good program to control weeds without putting any pesticides in the wastewater or ground on the water. ground. It's a good idea. Yeah, so we're uh, we're back today. Uh, I'm. Uh, Tyler Palmer and this is Ty Thompson I think most of you know Ty Ty works with our environmental services group and we're here to we're here to talk about something that we're pretty excited about which is our uh, hot water weed control um, something that we always try and take seriously is sustainability in, in our work um, you know working in a government setting municipalities um, have really started to lead the way when it comes to sustainability and, and we think Moscow can play a, a really interesting and, and cool role in the community and our ability to look for the most sustainable ways to conduct the work that we have to conduct. And so uh, this is one that we're pretty excited about. Um, turns out that uh, the chemical uh, dihydrogen monoxide is not as dangerous as others <laughs> when you use it. And so, uh, so I've got Ty Thompson here and Ty did a lot of work on this. This is something we became aware of a technology that we thought could tie into an issue that we were having um, with our right-of-way weed control and so I'm gonna let Ty talk you through what happened and what we're doing. Okay, Ty. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, happy to be here on a little bit of a lighter note. Uh, this was something that uh, it was really interesting to look into when Tyler you know posited this. Is this something that can work for us? Um, so I'm gonna kind of just walk through the process here, look at the options that we explored and and, and how we, we got here. Uh, a little bit of a background on what it, it, it says it's our current chemical weed control program that's should say our moving towards our past program um, but this is what we did to control weeds in our in our right of way uh, streets sidewalks um, some places around stormwater detention ponds things like that so it's <coughs> discrete areas uh, places that public work staff needs to work uh, we had an annual uh, external contract. External contractor would come through. We would set the path and ask them to come through and, and spray the weeds with, with herbicides. Um, the cost increased almost every year since 2012 and that. There was one year it was the same. So that's been, had been increasing. And recently, we, this last year, we've actually had difficulty even securing a new bid. There were some changes with the company that we had worked with before, and, and so that was even just getting hard to, to maintain that. Um, so this was an excellent time to just explore this. Everything kind of came together. Um, the benefits, you know, a lot of this is, is pretty self-explanatory. Using water uh, in the form of steam reduces human health um, exposure and, and that to the environment as well. Um, we found that there could be a short time to realize some cost savings, which I'll talk about further. Uh, and it brought an internal program where we could take care of all the quality control, quality assurance to make sure that this was being done the way that, uh, that we wanted to see it done, that we were getting the results uh, from our own team. The, the best way to go about this, we found, was by uh, hydrothermal steam control or weed control using 
using steam. You know, the other options are going out there with a torch, um, you know, maybe trying to freeze them, but that isn't really very effective and, and not the way that, that, that this um, was going to work for us. Again, like I said, it's, it's hot water or steam to use to kill weeds. This isn't necessarily brand new, but the way uh, using it on a, on a large scale kind of is. Um, what it actually does is it boils the water in the plants, exploding the cell walls. So, so it's, it's not just killing it, it's, it's really rupturing those cell walls. And you can see, we'll kind of show you a little bit here, it, it's, it's, uh, it happens pretty quickly. And it means that the plants can actually decompose fairly quickly, which, which is a benefit in itself. Um, like I said, it's a localized application. We're looking for specific points that we're applying this for the Public Works Department. Uh, one of the main benefits that we, we see to this as well is it can be applied in any weather. It doesn't matter if it's windy. Uh, we don't have to worry about overspray, those herbicides getting to areas that we don't want those. And it's, it's, it's steam. It's not going to get washed away. It hits it. It happens very quickly. And then, and, and then it's done. So, so we're really happy to um, to move in that direction. I found that there were two types of equipment out there. Um, one of them used a, a foam, some chemicals to, to make a foam to capture the steam, and then one is, one is just straight saturated steam, superheated water. Um, the foam plus steam uh, it uses a, a mixture of plant oils and sugar, so it is biodegradable. Uh, it's very minimally uh, chemically, I should say, uh, but the, th the theory behind that is that it, it, that foam matrix holds the heat in place for a longer period of time. You place it down and then can move on. Uh, and it also uses slightly less water because it's, it's, again, less time in any one given place that you're applying it. Um, the machine was very programmable, touch screen, a lot of, a lot of technologically advanced moving parts, uh, which has its pros and its cons, um, is a more expensive machine by a fair amount. And so that, that was something that, that figured into the decision of which way to go. The saturated steam, it uses just steam. That's it. Water only. Um, and I found it's between 235 and 255 degrees Fahrenheit, so, so very hot. Um, it's a simpler operation in, in, in terms of everything is basically analog. It's you turn this knob and turn this dial to dial it in to get what we need for specific temperature, time of day, um, what have you. Uh, it uses more water because it is just the steam. There's, that's what it is. You're putting that directly onto the weeds. Uh, there's a, a diesel burner that actually heats it up and then a gas gasoline pump. So there's two different motors there. It's substantially less expensive than the, the foam plus steam option. And it was almost uh, approximately three times less expensive. So again, we, that definitely figured into the decision. And with that, that, that was really the way that we decided was the best way to go. Um, simpler op operation, uh, less cost. That's, that's kind of the way we kind of focused the, the investigation uh, for what's going to work for our department. Landed on Weed Technics is the company that we, that we started looking into. And uh, a main reason for that is they're one of the only ones that do this. It's relatively new to the United States um, at all. This company, company originated in Australia. Um, there are others, but I really could not get anyone to respond for some of the others. Um, it's in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, somewhat in Canada, but, but this is pretty emerging technology in America. Um, it's being used a lot by folks in organic agriculture, uh, which makes a lot of sense for them. Um, some schools, uh, but very few municip municipalities. Um, <coughs> once it was uh, digging in, I found um, just recently that Salt Lake City has one that's used this in uh, that's being used in a similar capacity that we're looking for. So I look forward to talking with them and, and seeing how you know their successes and, and, and struggles and how they've worked through that. Uh, so we're excited. I mean, 
we're one of the first and especially in the area. Um, here's some f photos that, uh, that I've taken from the Weed Technics website that kind of got us excited. You know, here's, um, hopefully we don't see anything that's quite like that, but you never know. Um, that's the before. During, you can see how quickly it kind of, I mean, it's like broccoli, you know. It gets that nice bright green when you steam it. So it's pretty easy to tell when it's, when it's finished doing its job. And then here's a picture of the same street after, which looks fantastic, right? So um, coming from the company that's selling this, I'm not surprised that they put forth such a beautiful before and after. Uh, but uh, found that the University of Colorado Boulder has been using this equipment. And so here's a little intro from them that kind of gives a, a little visual. Looks like we don't have any sound, which is too bad. You can hear that thing hissing and puffing and, and, and what it's actually like there. Um, <coughs> well, next time we'll do a run through beforehand to make sure that we, we have some sound next time. Anyway, he's talking about their um, their program there and, and at the University of Colorado. I'm not clicking anymore today. Okay. So, University of Colorado Boulder, uh, pretty progressive. They are not a completely herbicide and pesticide free campus, but they do have some areas uh, that they absolutely that they don't unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, all of their turf they manage for weeds and, and pests um, without the use of, of herbicide. Their pollinator beds, of course, and, and then there's some other sensitive areas that are very close to dining centers that they've they've labeled off uh, off limits to chemical application. Um, their housing facility services has followed this for all of the areas they maintain. So they decided to, um, to, to go herbicide and pesticide free in all of their, their hardscape areas, all of their garden beds, all of their um, flower beds and things like that. So, um, and they've been doing that since I believe 2011. So they've had some experience. They were doing that all by hand in everywhere. So it was a labor intensive. Uh, they actually found this technology through an accident. They had a flood that got into some of their boilers, some steam, uh, steam tunnels. I don't know exactly what happened, but it, a lot of steam shot out and killed some areas that they didn't want to be killed, but it kind of led them down this path. And so they did a 60-day trial in the summer of 2016, pretty well designed. You know, they looked at what does this take for us to do it the way that we're currently doing it, and then how well does this work comparatively? 80% uh, of the areas that they treated with the steam had less than 5% weed cover after only one or two treatments, which they were having to go back very often to do that by hand. Um, they found that it was much more effective and efficient than their previous uh, techniques for managing that. Uh, they were so happy with it they've purchased two more units so that was a really good um, really good <coughs> for us to see that they were that happy with their equipment here is a picture from their study that's a great that's the type of area we're going to be using it on hardscapes and with one treatment they saw that kind of results here is the unit we got. It's called the SW800 tank skid. You can see it has a big tank with an area for our, for our forklift skids to go in there and move it around. Um, it's good for us because it can be moved between vehicles, so it gives us some options and flexibility that way. It's large enough to meet our, our needs while <coughs> only being operated by one um, seasonal operator from the streets department. And uh, again, we found it to be a cost-effective option. The cost of this unit, 
fifteen thousand dollars seven hundred ninety two dollars not a small chunk of change um, this includes everything this is to our door it was delivered last Monday and we got our training included in that compare that to the weed control budget for the chemical weed control that we had been using um, 13,500 annually and as I said that was going up um, we were able to cover that difference out of that same budget line item so didn't have to break anything there and including labor by the time we get to FY 2021 we anticipate realizing savings of sixty seven hundred dollars um, every year so we're really excited about it again we're, we're excited for the opportunity and the support that we've gotten from um, from administration and from from council to move in this direction and if you have any more questions about that I'd be happy to Eric. Yes, sir. How much uh, was our previous weed control budget, Ty? Do you recall? The thirteen thousand five hundred. Okay, so that's what was. Yep. That's what we paid to Show Brothers in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, does the budget projections include what I'm assuming will need to be an annual pressure vessel inspection? Because if you're putting steam out at that, means it's pressurized, and that would probably necessitate a pressure vessel inspection. Nothing like uh, the there was a, a as part of the training was working with our fleet staff so the, it's a very extensive manual uh, our staff was familiar with a lot of the motors and the the burner and a lot of that stuff so we're going to be able to to take care of a lot of that maintenance in house the actual output pressure of it um, that comes out of the nozzle is about five psi you're right there is some pressure built up internally. So, so that's something that... But to get to 235 to 250, you're looking at 20-some PSI in the boiler. Yeah, I, 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 our fleet guys would be the best ones to answer that question. We do have an annual um, inspection that we have done on all the pressure vessels that the city has, and so we have them come through, and we have the annual inspections. And so the increment would probably be nil or next to it just to do one more. Yeah, to pick okay, up that fine. one. And so if, if it's in the O&M manual, the fleet guys will have it added to that inspection rotation. Cool. Thank you. I'm guessing that that operates like an insta hot hot water heater where you don't have a large amount of pressurized steam it's heating the heating the water as as needed and not yep. containing a bunch so lower the, mm -hmm. lower the amount of that unless you don't have to an applicator's license wouldn't be required for this because you're not using any chemical right no, it's, it's, right. it's one of the reasons we were drawn to this unit is because in order for us to effectuate the most cost savings, we really want to be able to have a, a seasonal employee operate the, the piece of equipment. It's, it's something that needs to be done seasonally. Um, Steve Schulte, our street, super, our, our street manager, is here with us today, and he, uh, he's, he's been working out how to have that done and what, what tasks and duties could be combined with this to maximize the efficiency of those seasonal hours. And so we... Uh, it's it's a <coughs> relatively simple setup to use. It's you know just adjust it, optimize it, and go burn the weeds. No, it'll be interesting to see how it works out on weeds that grow on a rhizome. You know that are extensive, have extensive uh, root structures underneath the ground, and how fat, how much it destroys them, and how slow they come back. That sure, we are. You know, we're definitely excited about the the opportunities and possibilities with this. There may be some areas where we find. For the for certain weeds, certain areas that we we might have to use chemicals in some areas, but based on the experience that that others have had, and and that was the great thing about talking with uh, Mr. Willard at University of Colorado was their firsthand experience with it. That was the biggest thing, you know, that that we really were happy to talk to someone that had used it and and had had successes, had had some challenges, um, and so so we, we feel we feel good going forward. I do too. I like yeah, it. I think it's cool. a great idea. Or rather, well done. Hot. Well played. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, final report on today's agenda is the Third Street Bridge update. Um, Mr. Palmer has something going on. Promised me some pictures of the um, actual physical presence of this structure. Yeah, some some verification that she exists. <laughs> All right, I'm back again. Um, yeah, uh, this is our monthly update as requested um, by council on the Third Street uh, Bike and Pedestrian Bridge. This, these are actual images of our bridge in fabrication. Um, 
I've got a couple other images that I'll flip through as I stand up that just show some of the steel that's on hand. So it is it is being fabricated as we speak. Um, we had uh, some big snow piles at the end of Third Street that uh, we're looking at needing to haul off in order to get the survey done to uh, to move forward with the um, setting of the footings, the the seals that we set for to support the bridge. Um, but that's all on schedule. Uh, we've got streets and engineering working together uh, on that project. Um, we got an updated uh, estimate on delivery time from True North, which is the company manufacturing the bridge, and they anticipate late April is what they're telling us for delivery. Um, that works out pretty well with our schedule. It'll allow us time to get it surveyed, get the seals set, and then the nice thing is if we can, we should be able to have them deliver it directly to the site and we can plop it directly on so it saves us having to have a crane twice and mobilize twice and on and off and so we want to do that efficiently that's, a, that's how we did it with college street when that bridge was installed and that worked really well and so the idea is over the next uh, three weeks we'll be going gangbusters to get the the rip wrap in place get the seal set um, and be ready to go and then bring her in and put her in place and then we'll start the work of tying it all together getting the deck on and away we'll go so uh yeah we're we're uh Cautiously optimistic that she's all coming together. We should should be able to cross the bridge by May. Hmm? Yeah, that's that's the hope. I'll show you some pictures as I walk away. Unless right. there's any other questions that anybody has. Okay. Pictures. <laughs> How did Jim Bolden cross the stream? <laughs> well, that's another image of it. And that's the steel that they'll use to put it together. Those are the pictures. <laughs> have a photo of the mine where the ore came from. Uh, no, like, we asked for it. <laughs> no shop drawing of how it looks when it's done, or you, you can know. get a real good idea if you want to look at College Street. That's it, it's it'll be almost identical to that yeah. one. Yeah. Except it, this one will have some sort of hook structure to pick it back up because it obviously at some point in the future it'll be moved mm -hmm. so yeah it'll have this has this has some additional reinforcement um, which which ended up being more cost effective initially we'd looked at having uh, a system in place where we could put a wood deck on it for now and then it would accommodate a concrete deck later on as we worked through it with the company to get the to to do the structural analysis of that it ended up being cheaper for us to have them add structural support to the pan itself which will allow us to do a concrete deck which will be much better for for maintenance especially winter maintenance of this facility um, and then it'll we'll be able to with that structural reinforcement pick it up with the concrete deck in place for relocation great thank you sir all right thank you thanks Tyler Nito torpedo <coughs> anybody else have any f anything further not a greater good I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting then. Entertainment. All right. Thank you very much.